Dr. Richard Popiel. Nowadays, protecting employee health involves many tasks, but let's face it, the biggest is still writing that check to your insurance carrier. As the leader of Horizon Healthcare Innovations, a wholly owned subsidiary of Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Dr. Richard G. Popiel is pioneering innovative new models of payment and care delivery. In plain English, that means he's finding ways to improve quality and patient satisfaction, while at the same time controlling costs. Put in yet another way, he's helping healthcare professionals earn more based on quality and value, not simply the number of tests and procedures they perform. Both a physician and an MBA, Dr. Popiel brings us an exceptionally valuable perspective. Please welcome him. Good morning. Uh, I work for a strong, rightly intentioned healthcare company called Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Before I became president and chief operating officer of Horizon Healthcare Innovations, a new company that was formed September 17th, 2010, I served as the chief medical officer at Horizon for the last 10 years. In that role, Every day I worked on trying to realize the goals and aspirations of Horizon, which was to improve the quality of care for the 3.6 million members it serves and to make that care affordable. And I could spend hours, days, listing all the things that we do uh, to try to achieve quality and affordability. And I would say that whether it's Horizon Blue Cross, Blue Shield of New Jersey, or the 38 other blues plans, or the other health plans uh, in the country, or the physicians around the country, the hospitals around the country, the pharmaceutical benefit management companies who you heard from before, or the pharmaceutical companies, or anyone else in the healthcare system. We're all trying to achieve the same goals of quality and affordability. That said, we are on an unsustainable path our health care spend as a percent of GDP is roughly 17 percent. I fear that in a relatively short period of time it's going to be 20 percent. If it hits 20 percent, all bets are off. Uh, the private sector will have little control uh, about the future of health care because the government will, uh, in, in my view, will, will take over. So to continue along the path of the status quo and do the same things we have been doing, it's just simply not going to produce a meaningfully different result. And that really was the genesis for the launch of Horizon Healthcare Innovations, uh, which is a company, uh, you can see the tagline. Uh, it's a new shade of blue, building on the strong foundation of Horizon uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, but trying to tackle the issues differently. Uh, and again, there is no silver bullet. Uh, there have been tremendous minds trying to deal with this issue for the last 30 years. And we still have a trend, although mitigated by the economy right now, that will exceed double digits in, in the next 24 months. And I, again, I, unless something dramatically changes, uh, I think the future of health care will be out of the control of the private sector and some of the leaders that you've heard from uh, today. So what I want to do is just leave you with some sense of how we're trying to tackle uh, this issue. We're not trying to come up with a great idea and say this is the way we're going to solve health care. We're experimenting. We're piloting. We're trying to create models of care uh, that we think address some of the root causes uh, in our health care system and test them in a collaborative way, in an innovative way. Uh, with our hospital partners, our physician partners, and other healthcare professionals. And it, ju and it doesn't just uh, deal with the delivery system. It also, as you heard, uh, involves uh, consumers, patients, and what their commitment and accountability is in being able to get a different result. So uh, this is uh, uh, sort of a snapshot uh, of where we want to go. Uh, and where we want to go is to address two things. First, uh, and you could look at a number of different sources, but Institute of Medicine is probably a reasonable one uh, to uh, look at in terms of how much waste and inefficiency exists in our healthcare system. 
and a general number uh, that's been postulated is about 30 percent. 30 percent of all health care services rendered and the costs associated with those health care services are thought not to add incremental value uh, to patients. Uh, so that's one issue, and we know there's waste and efficiency. We also know there's significant variation in health care. Uh, I'm not going to go over that in detail, but if you want to see the uh, depth of variation, go to the Dartmouth Atlas online. It's easy to access, and you can see variation across the country, and you can see variation uh, across counties within a state. It, it's, it's pretty dramatic. The other thing that we're trying to address is trend. Now, trend is driven for, uh, n n not necessarily due to waste inefficiency, but for two main reasons. One, probably for a good reason, is the development of new technology. Every day I see new technology in healthcare, I'm amazed and fascinated about how sophisticated it is and the potential value can it add, but it's costly. And we have to be thoughtful about the cost benefit uh, analysis that we uh, undertake regarding technology. So that's one key driver of uh, healthcare trend. The other driver was mentioned by uh, earlier, and that is the uh, health of our population. Our population is aging, and the burden of illness is, get, is greater in that aging population than it has been historically. So unless we address some of the underlying causes, obesity is a good example of an underlying cause, uh, of why our population is getting sicker, then uh, we're not going to be able to tackle this issue. So those are the two main, there's other drivers of trend, but those are the two major, major drivers of trend. So our goal over time is to incrementally get at the waste through collaboration and innovation, but ultimately try to get to a point where the healthcare spend uh, approximates CPI. That's our goals. That's what I'm responsible for uh, as president of this new company. We're trying to map to the national agenda. This happens to be an agenda of Don Berwick, CM CMS Administrator, uh, his concept of triple aim, uh, serving population, uh, enhancing the patient experience. That's just not quality uh, and satisfaction. It's also patient safety. Uh, there's plenty of literature out there about uh, unsafe care across the United States. So a key uh, area of focus for uh, Dr. Berwick. Uh, and also, and importantly, total cost of care, cost of care per capita. So those are the three things that uh, we use as the underlying drivers for what we want to accomplish in Horizon Healthcare Innovations. And so what we did is we spent probably a half a year really trying to understand a number of things. What were the root causes driving the current issues in our health care system. And then we look back and try to look at when we've attempted in a big way to solve this problem before, why it didn't work. And I think you can go back to the 90s. Uh, I, somebody asked a question earlier about capitation and try to understand why that effort did not work. And that was some of the deep dives that we did in our analysis before we started to plan what our models would look like. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we, could, we could spend a lot of time talking about why capitation, global uh, payment didn't work back in the 90s, but uh, a couple of reasons uh, that are worth mentioning are uh, it wasn't a collaborative model, it was a financially driven model. So typically across this country, health plans created a financial incentive and said to the delivery system, you do this, you get X, you don't do it, you don't get X. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of data, and there wasn't a whole lot of collaboration, uh, and there wasn't a lot of infrastructure at the time uh, to support the delivery system. And now we're talking about RIOs, hard, hard nut to crack, we're still working on it. We're talking about electronic medical records. We're talking about a different kind of infrastructure, an infrastructure that did not exist uh, back in the 90s. So there are things that have changed that have now made it possible potentially accomplish things that weren't available back then. So in our uh, analysis, we decided to focus on a number of key areas. One, patient-centered medical home. We have a distressed primary care workforce, not only in New Jersey, but nationally. Uh, it was somewhat encouraging in the last 12 months to hear that the percent of medical school graduates going into primary care has increased 
but I would say that it has increased from 2 percent where it had been for a couple of years prior. So very few physicians graduating from medical school are going into primary care. Hopefully, as this patient-centered medical home movement takes a more significant hold, uh, we'll see more uh, of an appetite by medical school graduates to go into primary care. But patient-centered medical home, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, connecting a patient and a physician and creating a different model of engagement uh, is really crucial for us. We think it is the foundational component of the healthcare system. Accountable care organizations, I think you heard a couple of comments about some of the uh, missteps that have happened. Uh, the, the first set of regulations uh, were not well received. It wasn't just the Cleveland Clinic, it was other major well-recognized, uh, highly regarded organizations. Mayo Clinic, another example of an institution that did not react well to the regs. We're expecting a new set of regs uh, any day. But whether it's accountable care organization, patient-centered medical home, or even episode of care, the health care debate over the last 24 to 36 months, which will certainly continue uh, over the next 12 to 18 months as we get closer to the election, uh, may have created uh, health care reform legislation. But independent of health care reform legislation, the train has left the station. There is activity uh, that, in my mind, in my view, is unprecedented uh, relative to what's happened over the la last 10 years. You look in New Jersey uh, as an example. Uh, we're seeing hospitals, uh, to some extent, re-engage in an activity around acquiring either physician practices or the assets of physician, uh, physician practices. Uh, we're seeing new entrants coming into the market. Uh, I believe Geisinger, which is uh, located in northeast Pennsylvania, is coming into the market in Ocean County. So we're seeing just significant change that's occurring here. I mean, if you look nationally, it's dramatic. Health plans are getting into the business of delivery of care. I think the most recent dramatic announcement uh, in the last month was United Healthcare. Uh, acquiring, uh, a, I believe it's a 2,300 physician group uh, in Southern California, the Monarch Group. Uh, these are dramatic changes uh, in what our current healthcare system uh, uh, has been doing. And these forces aren't uh, uh, in response to healthcare reform. I'm sorry, these, these aren't in, in, a, in an attempt to comply with the health care reform legislation. They're in response to health care reform and a private sector uh, movement to try to address some of the, the issues and, and, and for many players to position themselves to be successful in the future. So whether the regs come out in a positive or not so positive way over the next month or two, you're still going to see the development of accountable care organizations. I know there are people in this room who uh, have developed accountable care organizations, and we're going to continue to see that uh, emerge. And it makes sense. It's integrated health care. It makes sense. So again, regardless of health care reform, I, I think integrated health care is the right thing to do. Episode of care, uh, these are more discrete uh, uh, either conditions or procedures. I'll talk about it in just a moment. Uh, another important aspect of us, consumer engagement, uh, crucial. And I'll give an anecdote uh, uh, that uh, supports the uh, examples that you heard before, which I think is dramatic. Uh, and then we've also began to tackle some specialty areas like oncology. So these are the pilots. These are experiments that we have undertaken in, in our first eight months of, of being a company uh, to try to address the root causes in the healthcare system. And let me go into a little bit more detail about some of these. I won't have enough time to go into detail on all of them. So patient-centered medical home. It's reestablishing the primacy of the patient-physician relationship and making the primary care physician uh, at the center of that relationship. I know there are differing views about whether this is the right path or not. We believe it's the right path. A typical primary care physician today, which on a relative basis to specialty care, gets paid um, uh, much less. Uh, and in order to make the economics of their practice work, they have to see enough volume of patients every day. And, and by the way, we pay generally 
or our country pays generally on a fee for service basis, so it incents volume, not value. But they have to see enough patients to make the economics of their practice work. That gives them precious little time to coordinate care, to think about the comprehensive things that need to be done for not just a particular patient, but also the population that they're serving. Uh, and we have to change that. Uh, they're also, uh, unfortunately, not practicing at the top of their license. Because they have to do this activity, because they have to see so many patients, they tend to be doing things that are, are not necessarily the things that they learned and, and were trained to do in, in medical school. They, they're practicing at the lower end of the set of skills and capabilities that they have. So we, we want to change that model. Uh, we want to encourage not just the centricity of that relationship, but empower that relationship through infrastructure, through data, uh, through a uh, clear set of targets that we can collaborate on and achieve, and those will then feed into the affordability and uh, quality um, uh, goals that we have. Uh, we started actually uh, in this endeavor before HHI was created. We started it four years ago. We had a large number of doctors. We narrowed that down uh, just before the creation of HHI to about 189 doctors. And when we initiated HHI, we actually narrowed that down to eight practices, 63 physicians, tw about 24,000 patients. Why did we do that? because our model is about transformation. There's finances involved, no question about that, but we really want to create a sustainable transformation in a physician's practice in collaboration with those physicians so that regardless of what happens, that kind of model uh, continues in the future. So in order to do that, we didn't want to have 1,000 physicians or 2,000 physicians uh, uh, involved in this at the, at the beginning. We wanted to learn how to best do that, working with the, these eight practices, and then ultimately create a playbook, if you will, of how physicians can succeed, primary care physicians can succeed in this model. And that's work that we're doing. We're meeting with these practices, with these physicians, almost every day uh, on a number of different work streams that will impact the workflow uh, and how they do their business in, 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 in clinical care in their offices. So that's work that's ongoing, and we're excited about the early indicators. Uh, I'm reluctant to share anything with you today because we're still relatively early, but there's some early indicators that are promising. Uh, we did uh, the initial launch in collaboration with the New Jersey Academy of Family Practice. I can't speak uh, highly enough about them in terms of their support, particularly in getting these practices certified. Uh, by NCQA, which is the only certifying body right now to acknowledge that a practice has met the criteria for becoming uh, a patient-centered medical home. Our payment model for these physicians is uh, really twofold at this point. We're paying a care coordination fee, so an upfront fee on, uh, per member per month. So it's kind of like capitation, but it's different because we're still paying on a fee-for-service basis for all the services rendered. We want to try to provide some financial input, a revenue stream, so that the physician can back off and begin to make investments in the things that they need to be successful going you know, forward and not just get on this treadmill and see as many patients as they can. We're also paying at this point an outcome-based payment uh, to, uh, that maps to both quality uh, and uh, use indicators. And these are all indicators, not, not that HHI has developed, but that HHI, in collaboration with these physicians, have developed. And then I can't emphasize the importance of data. Uh, data, without data, we don't know where we are. The physician practices don't know where they are. Where they are. And certainly the outcomes for the patients uh, become unclear. So we, have, we created an informatics capability in Horizon Healthcare Information whose whole purpose is to create a richer set of data, usable data, actionable data, that is available on a much more timely basis to these physicians so they know where they stand, and then we can take, in collaboration, actions around closing gaps when gaps exist. So really important and crucial, and this cuts across not just patient-centered medical home, but also uh, on our other pilots. Accountable care organization, uh, you um, 
you've, you've heard about it a little earlier. Uh, we actually, uh, uh, more opportunistically than anything else, began a pilot with a medical group uh, and two large employers uh, and uh, we're, we're testing the effectiveness of that model. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, over the next 12 months uh, that uh, we take additional steps with hospital-centric uh, or hospital-based organizations uh, to do additional accountable care models. But I think uh, we're uh, very anxiously looking forward to these regulations to see uh, if there's alignment across the country with what health plans are doing, with what the delivery system is doing, and with what the government is intending to do. And I hope, I hope sincerely that the government listened to the feedback that they got because it was pretty intense feedback. Um, I, again, we want to try to walk, crawl before we walk, and walk before we run. That was another mistake back in the 90s. It was just, it was kind of a, uh, no, no insult to Nike, but it was just kind of a just do it mentality back in the 90s. I'll give you the money and you figure it out. Uh, we want to make sure that each step along the way, we have rallied around the success factors, achieved those, know what drive them so there's a cause and an effect, not just a result that we're not really sure how that result was achieved, and then take the next steps. So we don't want to put, we don't want to be in a risk situation in, in, with a delivery system if the delivery system is not ready to do that. So we need to know, be certain, be clear about w what the success factors are. Episode of care, uh, what is an episode of care? It's a single practice, practice being uh, an entity. An entity could be a hospital and physician, a hospital or a physician, uh, or, or just a physician that organizes the full spectrum of care for a specific procedure. Procedure could be a hip replacement, a knee replacement, it could be coronary artery bypass surgery, it could be colon resection, it could be a colonoscopy, it could be a whole number of things. But it's inclusive of everything related uh, to that episode. So when you think about uh, a hip replacement, there's, uh, and we're focused uh, for the purposes of study and analytics, we're focused on uh, a narrow subset of patients who get hip replacements, those with osteoarthritis, those who aren't emergent. Uh, and uh, so the, it all begins with the decision to operate. Once that decision to operate is made, our episode is slightly different than the four models that were uh, released by CMS in the last month. It's 30 days prior to the operation. It's everything that's included in the operative, uh, in the inpatient stay, uh, including the implant type. Now, if you look at levers about why these episodes are more costly, one of the big reasons is implant choice. There's a concept called demand matching. That concept is there's a patient uh, who has certain characteristics that based on those characteristics should get a certain kind of implant. Now, you don't need a highly technical, sophisticated implant that can withstand stress. So if an athlete has a catastrophic injury and needs a hip replacement and wants to go back to sports, you don't need that type of implant in a 75-year-old person who wants to walk pain-free. So there's, there's a matching that needs to occur between the patient uh, and the implant type. And this is important because if you don't need to put an $80,000 implant in, and you can just get, away, get, get along with a 5,000 implant, get the same level of quality, patient satisfaction, et cetera, that's what you ought to do. But that, that does not happen. The, the, um, the process is convoluted by the relationship between the manufacturers and the orthopedic surgeons, it creates tremendous consternation for hospital executives because they don't really have total control over this. It, it, it's an issue. And that's just one example of multiple levers across an episode uh, for hip or knee replacement. And then there's the 90 days following uh, discharge, which includes rehab, but it can include home care, a, a number of different care venues in the recuperation period. And I'll tell you, this, this whole issue around hip replacement is, is evolving. There are doctors today, orthopedic surgeons today, who are doing same day hip replacement. What that means is the hip replacement is being done and the patient's being discharged from the hospital that same day. It may be to a skilled nursing facility or could even be to home uh, with home care support. But the field is evolving. 
So to us, it's really important that we create a collaborative model with the orthopedic surgeons that are involved. And we have five orthopedic groups that are helping us. And, and, and the way we think about it is they have, we have kind of built, framed a house, and they're building the interior and doing the interior decorating. They're putting the fine points on what this model should look like. Uh, and uh, we're really excited about uh, this particular model. And now it maps to some extent to the four models that were just launched by, uh, or released by CMS. Again, our payment process for episode of care is the same as I just mentioned earlier. We want to crawl before we walk and walk before we run. So the first six months of, of this particular pilot was really an advisory uh, focus, getting that advice and input so that together we could build out what the model looks like. We've now transitioned into a shared savings model, trying to look at some of the key components that um, are, are the levers for, for uh, inappropriate cost. And then ultimately we'll make a decision about whether we actually go to a full bundled payment. We're, we're a ways away from that. We still have much uh, learning to do and analytics to conduct. Um, consumer engagement. Let me just say this. We don't have, uh, and I know we're all consumers and some of us are patients out here, we don't have a, an engaged um, consumer um, group, uh, patient group uh, in this state or in this country. We just completed a, a number of focus groups uh, and uh, we asked them if they knew what a patient-centered medical home was. Uh, very few knew what it was. And when then we, we socialized the name with them and asked for the reaction, the reaction was that it was a home for the aged. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of work to be done about what, what is it that you expect from your health care system. When you go to a physician's office, when you try to make an appointment, when you have an emergency at 10 o'clock at night, what should you get? What, what are your expectations? And th there's lack of clarity around that. So for, uh, and the same thing exists for accountable care organizations. It, people don't know what they are. We know what they are. I mean, they're a big policy debate, but the average person on the street doesn't know what they are. So there's work to be done around what to expect, this whole concept of consumerism that was mentioned before, uh, uh, what to expect from the delivery system. On the other end, there is uh, real issues about following the treatment recommendations of a physician. You heard a bunch of examples. I'll give you one more. When we finished um, the first phase of our uh, work with e-prescribing, so as e-prescribing became user-friendly, as doctors were able to use an e-prescribing capability, they, they could write a prescription, and this exists commonly today, and that prescription would be sent wirelessly to a pharmacy. So you could know what the first fill rate is, how many patients actually went to the pharmacy and picked up their script. So I'll give you one example. I have numerous. We study 3,000 people who were newly diagnosed with heart disease, coronary artery disease. They were prescribed a statin, a drug to uh, l limit that plaque development in the artery. The percent that actually picked up their script was 35%. 65% did not pick up their script. So you can start thinking about why. Was it the physician didn't create a burning platform, the patient didn't understand it, the co-pays were too high? You, there, there's a, a host of potential reasons as to why that did not happen. And I can tell you that in every class of drug that we looked at, while it wasn't as dramatic as that example, it was dramatic enough to be seriously concerned about even starting the therapy, and you heard uh, the um, examples about what happens over time, the 90% example. So we have a, either an uninformed, uninterested uh, uh, community of patients who are not following their recommendations. So even if the delivery system, doctors, hospitals, uh, other healthcare professionals are wildly successful about accomplishing these goals around quality, if you don't get patients to follow those treatment recommendations, we're, we're done out of the gate. So let me try to finish, uh, let me try to uh, 
finish uh, one point about consumer engagement. We also tested a couple of early models, and I'll just give just just to give you a, a flavor for the kind of work that we're doing. We married an old technology or concept called remote monitoring, monitoring when the patient's not in the office, with new technology, wireless technology, Bluetooth technology. So we put wireless scales and wireless pulse oximeters. Pulse oximeter is a neat tool that measures how much oxygen is in the patient's blood. We put them in 168 patients who had congestive heart failure. So as soon as they got on the scale and their weight was registered, it automatically populated a centralized a uh, central dashboard. There's somebody looking at that dashboard. If the weight was out of range, there was an immediate intervention. So we went way up, uh, upstream to determine uh, where a patient was at when they're out of the office, when they're not face-to-face -face with the doctor or their staff. Uh, and uh, we are just evaluating the results of that right now. A really exciting uh, first start on, on consumer engagement. We also did something else in that study. We implemented a, um, a questionnaire called PAM, Patient Activation Measure, which basically breaks down or categorizes these patients into four levels of activation. Because so we want to know if, again, it gets to the point about the 90 percent. If we want to know if somebody's not activated, they're not going to start taking care of themselves from day one. What kind of interventions can we do? Again, more experimentation out of that. At the end of the day, pretty bold for a health plan to do this create a separate company. I think we're the only health plan in the country that has created a separate company to do this kind of work. We realize that we want a credible, defensible um, uh, understanding of the success or, may, or maybe not the success of some of these pilots. So instead of doing that analytical work ourselves, we engaged a third party. We actually created a consortium. It wasn't a single institution. And it's Penn, Rutgers, Carnegie Mellon, and Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, Penn, Kevin Volp, one of the national experts on consumer engagement. His, his subspecialty, he's a physician, his subspecialty is using regret to drive better consumer um, compliance. And I can go, that's, that's a whole story in itself. And then from Harvard, Meredith Rosenthal, one of the top health services researchers in the country. These, this consortium, third party, independent, we have no influence over what they do in terms of the analytical, analytical work. Their analytical work is done based on you know, robust academic standards, and that gives us uh, the level of credibility we think we need when we're reporting out the results of these pilots. So with that, let me just, uh, I'm not going to read these. These are a couple of quotes from our orthopedic surgeons. This is the group I was most worried about uh, you know, starting out. Uh, thinking that they would not be as engaged. Uh, surgeons in general like to cut. They like to be in the OR. Uh, we're asking them to do a lot more than just operate, uh, and, and this group is highly engaged. So with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you, Richard. No discussion of health care reforms uh, complete without a discussion of payer reform, and you touched upon incentives for uh, proper behavior and move toward the wellness. Um, I guess the general sense is that it's not happening fast enough and are the payers fully committed to rewarding people for staying out of the realm of a patient and remaining a consumer of wellness activities as opposed to uh, getting into the more serious, more expensive therapies? Yeah, I, I, wish, it w I wish it could happen faster. I mean, I, we have the ability to, to flip the switch and, as an example, make, make some of the things I talked about available to the entire delivery system. But I don't think that's prudent. And I think we've had a, a numerous great ideas over the last 20 years that didn't work. And so we, we want some level of confidence uh, in collaboration. Uh, we, uh, that, that, that these, uh, th these pilots, these new models are going to work. So I wish it could go faster, uh, but I, I have to remind myself that 30 years have gone by and we really haven't effectively solved the problems yet. It's going to take some time. You made a comment before about uh, a primary care physician practicing at the top of their license. Uh, related to a story I was discussing earlier, a classmate of mine from college, a very talented pediatrician, recently 
left practice and is now a high school chemistry teacher. Frustrations mm -hmm. over the things that she was forced to do. Does she meet with the mother and discuss, do you start peas first or carrots first? And uh, that's not practicing medicine. And her experience in the Navy pointed to having staff do that, group a bunch of young mothers, bring them in, and then she could come in and practice medicine. Do you see the care coordination fees or things like that in the uh, patient-centered med medical homes as a solution to that? So the doctors are being paid to practice medicine? One of the things that uh, is part of our model is the use of what we call a population care coordinator. Uh, said differently, that's an embedded nurse. So if you think about what health plans have done for the last 10 or 15 years, they've created armies of nurses, case managers and disease managers, uh, using technology and tools to identify high-risk individuals and then telephonically reaching out to them. That's been marginally successful, but not as successful as people had anticipated. And I think the primary reason is that it's not really emanating from the physician office. So what we have launched is a program where we're actually hiring nurses, and those nurses are being embedded in practices and helping the physician focus not only on the individual high-risk patients, but also the population of patients uh, in order to get the uh, outcomes that we've agreed on. So I think it's a team-based approach. I mean, that's, that's the other thing that I want to emphasize. What we're trying to work on with these primary care doctors is how to create a team-based approach and, and free them up so they can take care of the complicated cases. Uh, and not, not, that they need, not, not that they shouldn't be in touch with every patient in their, their, their panels. I mean, they should. I mean, it's the doctor leading uh, the care for their patients, but they need to have a team-based orientation, not an individual orientation. That is, in some ways, a problem in New Jersey because the majority of doctors, well, it's changing, but uh, the majority of doctors are solo practitioners. They don't have a lot of infrastructure uh, to, to support that kind of team-based model. So we're, uh, we're hoping, I, I, I want to preserve the, the, the right of an individual physician to be a solo practitioner if they want. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be, but I, I, I do think you, you, you have the potential to get a better result with integrated, uh, a, a larger group, and you can have that infrastructure to allow them to do that kind of work. Uh, doctor, on your second to last slide, you referenced technology, uh, tele, uh, telemonitoring, and smartphone applications. Um, how else do you anticipate uh, technology, specifically wireless technology, impacting the future of Horizon or the healthcare industry in general? Just in general, uh, on the uh, technology engagement front, uh, we're focused on three major categories. The remote monitoring category that I mentioned, and it's not specific to congestive heart failure, there are other disease states that we're considering right now. We'll probably do something uh, in the next three months with, di with diabetes. So remote monitoring and, and really trying to figure out if it can, it can be successful. There have been attempts historically without the, the wireless technology input that haven't been as successful as people had hoped for. So it's really marrying technology with, with a remote capability. Mobile health is a big opportunity. I and mean, we heard about apps before. And so there is, I mean, you can go on to I, iTunes uh, and, or uh, um, the, I sto the iPhone store uh, and, and put in health, and there's numerous apps now, numerous apps in diabetes now. So we're exploring the mobile health op uh, opportunities uh, there. Uh, and I, it's, it's, it's not easy because there's a lot of good ideas, but there aren't necessarily a lot of good apps right now. And then the last is social media. You know, how do we use the social media concept, uh, not just to reach an individual, but to reach a population and see what the potential benefits are there. So we're, we're still, I would say we're still more in an exploratory stage around some of this, uh, but I think it's going to play an increasing role uh, over time. And as uh, you heard before, in 2014, we enter a retail market in healthcare, 30%, projected 30% plus or minus. Uh, of uh, U.S. citizens uh, are going to be purchasing their health care off an exchange, and uh, that's going to generate a whole host of new tools. In terms of how much does medical malpractice factor into reimbursement and just overall health care spending today? 
that's a big issue. Uh, I don't know that Horizon Healthcare Innovations is going to be able to solve that issue, but that's an issue. I, I, I don't know what else to say. That's an issue that needs to be solved. Uh, we, we have ample evidence-based guidelines now. Uh, we should be able to find a path forward uh, that not only uh, protects the patient, because we have to protect the patient, but also protects the physician. And if we can find a path forward uh, that enables that, uh, we would see premiums going down. But there are no easy answers to that question. One more question. I'm about to put you on a big spot. <laughs> In that team, I missed the pharmacist. So I want to, my question, I guess, is really is how can we integrate the pharmacist in there to support those specialist primary care physicians and to be more of the team rather than just dispensing a product? And can we at the school help you do that? So wonderful question. One of the key components of our program uh, is around pharmacy. We've actually revitalized the concept of academic, academic detailing with pharmacy, but for the purposes of engaging the practices around their uh, broad use of pharmaceuticals and how best to you know, get a quality outcome for their patient, but an affordable uh, outcome as well. So there's a, there's a complicated, uh, detailed strategy. We're using pharmacists a lot in our model. We're using pharmacists, we're using social workers, we're using behavioral health specialists. I mean, 30 percent of primary care visits have, as part of that visit, a behavioral health component. And it's under-recognized, uh, and it's not dealt with well currently. Thank you, Richard.